Good evening. Goodbye Forever, Volume 2 by Nakchang Rinpoche, Chapter 18, Part 1. The Indestructible Crown. I remembered what Akong Rinpoche had advised, and as soon as I caught wind of the 16th Gyalwa Karmapa coming to London, I booked a ticket for the event. I also booked a day return to London by train. It was a little expensive, but somehow I didn't want to hitch or to wind up sleeping on someone's floor. Actually, what I really did not want was to find myself in another stupid situation akin to what I'd experienced in Liverpool. In any case, the rain had set in and I didn't like leaving a bunch of wet gear where I parked the pixie chariot, free for anyone who fancied it. Maybe I was getting to be like debt, a seeker of comfort and ease. Maybe, but whatever, I wanted a simple experience, unadulterated by anyone too socially dysfunctional. The return ticket to London was a self-protective move, and I wasn't entirely sure whether I approved of myself. I wanted to attend the Vajra crown ceremony of the Galwa Karmapa. Then, after seeing Galwa Karmapa, I wanted to leave for the railway station, secure in the knowledge that I had a seat on a train that was bound for Bristol. I did not wish to have to converse with anyone spiritual. With a seat booked, simplicity was guaranteed, unless, of course, the train was taken over by ersatz Hindu hippies from the locked broom cupboard in hell. I planned to be silent for the whole day. I'd leave early and simply show my ticket. I'd smile at the railway staff, naturally, but I'd not utter a word. Maybe I'd pretend I was dumb. That may sound cranky, but it was the early 1970s and I still remembered my trips to Sami Ling. I'd made three trips and on each occasion I'd encountered people who seemed incapable of normal human interaction. I'd begun to feel that the whole scene around Tibetan Buddhism was riddled with personality disorders. Then I'd chide myself for this pusillanimous, parsimonious view. Who was I to speak? Exactly. At least, however, if I also had a personality disorder, I was never unfriendly or gratuitously obnoxious. I struggled with this idea. How did it sit with the altruism I was supposed to be developing? Compassion for all beings, wasn't that the main point? It was. But where was compassion in my outlook most of the time? The best I could manage seemed to be self-control in respect of caustic wit. I could pride myself on my lack of expressed anger, but the aggression contained in my unspoken witty rejoinders was something that caused me shame. Well, maybe not shame per se, maybe the very mildest mortification. It should have been shame, but there would have to be a few more years of practice before that was likely. Don't blame you, Vic, Penelope condoled on hearing my plan for isolation. She was the most tender-hearted of the three ladies and so I was reassured that I wasn't becoming misanthropic. There are some total screwballs out there. I suppose I came to the wrong person for a severe reprimand, I laughed. Do you want one? Probably not, but I deserve one. You take this too gravely. You're about the kindest person I know. So I don't think you need to chastise yourself just because you want to spare yourself exposure to too many raving antisocial lunatics. Right, well, if you say so. No, sorry, that didn't sound as I meant it. I mean, 
I'm grateful for your opinion and it does put my mind at rest. I'll just relax about it and accept the fact that I'm not quite the sociable being I thought I was. But you are perfectly sociable, Vic. It's just that you're moving in circles where there are more loonies than average. I mean, I seem to be able to live without meeting them. But Eastern religions look as if they have more than their fair share. I walked into the Shine a Light shop, or whatever it's called. Divine Light Mission, I suggested. That's right. Well, I went into their shop because they have some interesting second-hand clothes there. A lot of 1920s and 1930s things. But it wasn't possible to look around without being harassed by people asking me if I'd taken knowledge or whatever. I just told them I hadn't taken anything and didn't want to take anything. I just wanted to buy the emerald green dress. They sold it to me in the end, but not without a whole sales pitch about Guru Margarine. Guru Maharaji, I smiled. He's a young Hindu teacher who's popular right now. But yes, I know what you mean. Buddhism's not really so very different in terms of the people. Apart from the fact that Buddhism seems to draw a more intellectual clientele. They're not so very different in many ways. Apart from the old school brigade such as Christmas Humphreys at the Buddhist Society. They seem to think that Tibetan Buddhists are all more or less Satanists. Some are, of course. I met some down in Tintagel, a South African couple, who were right out of one of Poe's tales of mystery and imagination. As in, man, you should have seen them kicking Edgar Allan Poe. You're getting quick at this, Penelope, and yes, something like that apart from the fact that I'd rather have seen Mr Poe kicking them. They were from the other side of Creepy. They had this thing, if they suspected anyone of being a demon, they'd pull on their left ears while sticking out their tongues. Then if the person didn't react, that proved he or she was a demon. The husband, Gilbert Harris, was the worst of the two as he was rather power-crazed and seemed to live to manipulate people's words in conversation, so they'd come to feel doltish. He then established himself in an unassailable position of authority with anyone who fell for his logically aggressive posturing. Did he try that one on with you? Yes, on several occasions, but I'm afraid I frustrated him by being impervious. How did that work? I mean, what did you say? I just kept repeating that I didn't play word games. How did he respond to that? He raised his level of aggression and when he did that I told him that becoming increasingly aggressive would have no effect on me unless he became physically violent. He then told me I was acting hysterically and I replied that I was not marvellously interested in his opinion. In the end, he gave up. I think that the worst aspect of me, as far as he was concerned, was that he could not induce me to be aggressive in return. I can't say I felt happy about the situation, but I don't tend to be frightened by bullies. Well, not unless they're armed to the teeth or whatever. So, if I could ask, why did you stay in the same vicinity as this creep for a minute longer than it took to put on your coat? That's a long story. Nakpa Yeshe Dorje, with whom he'd studied, suggested I might like to make his acquaintance. So, as I'd been invited by Gilbert and his wife Elzeeb, to stay with them for Losar, Tibetan New Year, I decided it would be too timid to leave. There was a Losar festival and ceremonies to attend, and it would have been vaguely lacking in seriousness to have missed that, just because of some personal awkwardness. 
I did ask whether they would rather I departed, but they replied that if I was not a serious practitioner, then sure I did not need to stay. Sorry to say this, but I thought you said that you didn't let him manipulate you. Yes, that was certainly manipulation, but the reason I stayed was that I wanted to get a complete impression of the situation. I wanted to see how he would perform the ceremonies. I wanted to check out his books too. He had an immense library of books on Tibet and Vajrayana Buddhism. They had a fairly nice shrine room too, apart from the fairy lights, his gauche paintings and the sickly sweet Indian incense. The other thing was that I wanted to be able to tell Nakpa Yeshe Dorje that I'd met Gilbert and Elzeeb Harris. I didn't want to say that I'd gone to see them and left because I couldn't get on with them that well. In terms of manipulative behaviour, this might illustrate something. They gave a slideshow and in one photograph of the Ganges, I noticed something that looked like a hippopotamus. I asked what it was because I knew that the creatures weren't native to India and they replied, it's you. Now, I didn't understand the answer, so I asked again. They replied, it's you. Again, I failed to understand and so one of the others told me it was a human corpse and that they bloated in the river and looked like hippopotami. Then Gilbert and Elzeeb Harris opined that I knew quite well that it was a human corpse, but that I was in denial because I was afraid of thinking about death. How did you respond to that? I just smiled and said they were right and that I wasn't frightfully keen on dying. Strange to say, that seemed to throw them. Well, yes, Penelope laughed because you agreed without agreeing, by agreeing to a statement they'd not made. Most astute. Maybe, I grinned sheepishly, but it's more of a typical reaction of mine than anything astute. It's what I do more or less automatically if someone tries to be offensively clever with me. If they'd called my number on it, I'd have admitted my gambit and told them my semantic gymnastics were no better than theirs. They were expecting me to defend myself and give them just cause for lambasting me with how unenlightened I was. Maybe Buddhism really will have to be a solitary pursuit for you. Yes, but it was a mixed thing. There were other people there with whom I had a better rapport although they were all in awe of Gilbert because he'd learnt Sanskrit and Tibetan. That doesn't excuse him from being a sinister megalomaniac, though. Well, I'll give him his due. He is highly knowledgeable about Vajrayana ritual, as far as I can judge. I don't trust everything he says because he has a Western occultist angle that he insinuates where he can. I'm glad you're cautious. Well, yes, I'm suspicious of his knowledge. I think that what he learnt from Nakpa Yeshe Dorje is entirely valid, but he's something of an esoteric jack-of-all-trades. He seems to see Western astrology, theosophy and general occultism as being on a par with Vajrayana. He had 12 volumes of The Golden Bough, the Grimoire of Armadale, The Golden Dawn, and a bunch of other stuff that I can't remember. Madame Blavatsky and Alice Bailey. Oh yes, and a few Alistair Crowley books, such as The Book of Thoth on his shelf, and his wife read Tarot with the Alistair Crowley deck. That really is really creepy. Yes, creepy would probably be the operative word. They were also tediously bigoted about anything that wasn't alternative. 
They wore things like knitted trousers. Inventive, I must admit, but also peculiar. They reminded me somewhat of baby clothes. In fact, they made all their own clothes because buying clothes was for bourgeois materialists. They made them from old blankets and sheets that they dyed maroon. They dyed everything maroon so that they would look like monastic robes. They were highly industrious and resourceful, but the clothes just weren't made that well. Penelope, by this time, was almost crying with laughter at the description of their clothing, so I gave her some insights into their dietary preferences, endless dal, rice and porridge, with no evident distinction between breakfast, lunch and dinner. I lost half a stone in weight in the days I spent there, because everything they ate was vague, you know, a step beyond bland. It's not as if I'm that fastidious, but I found it nauseating. I'm used to Indian food and to extremely simple, low-budget Indian food, but what they ate was served with some sort of peevishly perverted Puritanism. Everything they wore, ate, said or read, seemed designed to show other people how others were regarded in comparison with Gilbert and Elsie Harris. Blimey, Penelope almost squawked. All that and the South African accent. Yes, that is not the most pleasant version of English I've ever heard. I guess the one good thing I could say about them is that they don't appear to be racist. Apartheid might have been useful in respect of them, however, Penelope laughed. Quite so, I smiled. The Tibetans I met in India and Nepal in 1971 weren't like that at all. Apart from being of another and markedly different culture, they were all quite normal and simple. They seemed genuinely happy, which was remarkable when you consider their hardships. The old Chang lady in whose hut I stayed, I shared a bedroom with her son, was such a kind woman. She really was. They live in these ramshackle huts with roofs and doors built out of flattened out oil cans. Yes, that's impressive. Maybe you'll just have to be incognito over here. Yes, avoiding people in this quarter does seem to be the best option. And don't forget what Jan told you. Leave when you first think of leaving? Yes, Penelope nodded, and I continued, Jan was a nice person. I liked her, and that first trip to Sammy Ling was a good one. There were a few neurotic types there, but even they became sociable before the end of my stay. And Kate, even though she introduced me to Atlas, was really all right. Her friend Amy was reasonable, even if she lived in fairyland. But since then... The number of genuinely uncomplicated, sociable people have gone into severe decline. Right, so just don't stay in places you don't want to be and don't associate with people just because you feel obliged or because you think you ought to be able to put up with anything. You know, that was very good advice Jan gave you. Yes, I mused. I think it was. I should have taken that advice in Liverpool. Penelope gave me a sideways glance and said, Yes, and maybe it could apply elsewhere too. Just take care and remember you don't have to accept everything that happens. It's not an act of cowardice to say, Sod this for a game of soldiers, is it? That made me laugh. And on that note, I went to bed and slept well, but I did not dream anything significant. The next morning I was up early and sat in silence for an hour. I felt it was the perfect start to the day. The taxi arrived and I alighted. Temple Meads? the taxi driver inquired, and I simply nodded with a friendly smile. It was true. 
I didn't necessarily have to speak. I didn't have to speak when showing my ticket either, and somehow I arrived in London without having uttered a word. The Vajra Crown Ceremony was to be held at the Friends Meeting House in Euston, London. It's opposite Euston Tube Station, a ten-minute walk from King's Cross and St Pancras stations. I decided I'd sit in Cartwright Gardens, in between taking walks to a few places. It was cold, so my periods of sitting in Cartwright Gardens were relatively brief. I went to a few bookshops. Arthur Probsthame was a marvellous shop near the British Museum and one of the places where I was sure to find books on Vajrayana Buddhism. I had my rocket bag which contained my robes, I'd put those on later, and there was room for a few books. I found too many to buy, let alone carry, and decided I'd have to make another trip at some point. I picked up a copy of the Chandra Das Tibetan English Dictionary and Demons and Oracles of Tibet by René de Nebeski Voskovitz. I tried reading it when I was at school and had found it impenetrable. It was an important work, however, so I decided I needed to own a copy. I'd been told that René de Nebeski Voskovitz had met some terrible end due to his messing with matters beyond his ken, and so, with his book in my bag, I made my way to the British Museum to see the Tibetan exhibit exhibits and to read in relative comfort. As I walked, the four top song flitted through my mind and I sang, in memory of René de Nebeski Voskovitz's death by otherworldly misadventures, just walk away, René, you won't see me follow you back home. Now that was the kind of thing that Western Buddhists would find severely unamusing. And it would have been impossible to explain that it was merely whimsicality. I wasn't callous concerning René de Nebeski Voskovitz's tragic demise, nor was I blasé concerning the material his book contained. It was simply wordplay or nameplay, and the fact that such humour was somehow irresistible to a dyed-in-the-wool punster such as myself would have been met with some unpleasant reaction. People in this sphere of interest seemed terribly keen on judging each other. I had an interesting day seeing a wealth of Tibetan culture from Tibet House, a shop down near the World's End pub on the King's Road, to the Tibet Society in Finsbury Park. I took, a, I took in the Lhasa and Kathmandu Trading Company in the Chelsea Antiques Market on the way. That was a remarkable place, and it turned out that the proprietors knew someone called Karma Lama, a Nawari Buddhist aficionado of blues, who might like to meet me when I went back to Nepal. I'd been calling in to the Lhasa and Kathmandu Trading Company since 1970 and had made some splendid purchases there. They seemed to enjoy my approach to spending. I'd say, Hello, I've come to buy whatever I can that's in my price range. I've got £123 to spend and I want to leave your shop without it. They'd then manage the bargaining for me and usually gave me a good deal on a few items. The price limit was always exceeded. In the past, I'd purchased some Vajrayana ritual appurtenances, a kangling, a nine-pronged griguk and a set of tingsha. This time, I obtained a reliquary box which contained a thumb-sized statue of Guru Rinpoche, the Tantric Buddha. They served me with tea and we talked a lot about Nepal. They advised me that I'd be better off going out there myself and buying the things I needed. They were making a living, naturally, but they saw no reason why I should pay their prices forever. 
I thought that was jolly decent of them and thanked them heartily for the good advice. They in turn gave me a list of places to visit, each different place being the best place to buy whatever. I was quite tired by the time I got to the friend's meeting house in Euston. There was already a throng, a throng of people waiting to enter the building and so I found a public convenience where I could change into my robes. The changing cubicle put me in mind of Superman's use of the telephone booth and that seemed suitably ridiculous to put me at my ease about appearing on the streets of London in a voluminous white pleated skirt.